Hello and welcome to the Ask Dave Anything, a multi-part, perhaps ever ongoing series about where you get to ask me questions about uh, game studios I've worked at, games I've worked on, game development, the game industry, or uh, countries that I've lived in. The way that this works is that uh, I've got a spreadsheet and when a column fills up to 25 questions, uh, I will go ahead and answer the questions from that column. And guess what? We have our first winner. It was game development. So let's answer some questions about game development. First question. Aren't writing and narrative design the same thing? Uh, no. So the difference between writing and narrative design, though often narrative designers do some writing, is that narrative design is about the paths and plots and context of the story that's being told in the game. So a narrative designer would be someone who designs perhaps the choices that a player might be able to make and how that loops back in, or they might have uh, some input on the context for how abilities are and how they should be named and, and all the lore aspects of the world. So uh, a writer might write a one page or 10 page or novel about the lore, and they might write the individual lines of dialogue. But generally, if they're just a writer, they're not doing the narrative decision trees and things like that, that you sort of need a design context for. So that is the difference between writing and narrative design. Uh, a, a pure, a narrative designer does do writing, but if they're just a writer, they might not do narrative design because they might not have an understanding of that. And that's typically what you see when we hire a Hollywood writer or a, a big name novelist or something like that. We'll bring them in to write the individual lines of dialogue, but a narrative designer has to sort of set it up for them first. So I hope that answers that. Question two. Can you recommend any specific communities or courses for aspiring game devs? And how can bright-eyed greenhorns stay away from scam courses that promise the world and end up teaching very little? I'm not too familiar with the modern like college courses and things like that. I So I don't have any specific recommendations on that. In terms of communities, uh, well, here's my channel. <laughs> this is what I'm here for. Join uh, my community and uh, as a, Sort of as an offshoot from my community, there are several um, mod communities and builder communities that have sort of sprouted up within, and they can maybe give you some recommendations on where to go for that. Um, but because I've never experienced these things, I don't want to recommend anything personally because I don't know. I can only recommend myself because I know that I give good advice and I've been in the industry for 23 plus years. But in general, uh, if you're an aspiring game dev, the most important things you can do is to play and understand games and then try to apply those learnings in a something you create. It can be a board game, it can be a prototype built in Godot or Unity or whatever, but you can sort of do all these things yourself and then it's just about the mechanics of how you do those things and there are a million tutorials online that can probably teach you those things. Question number three. I find it frustrating that the game managers pay too much attention to feedback and force me to change certain things in a way I disagree. How do you deal with this attitude? Am I wrong that some of the player's feedback should be ignored as they have no idea about the fundamentals of the game they are playing? I guess the fundamental question here is how do you deal with feedback from the community and, and how much should you listen to it versus how much you should uh, ignore it? And the answer to that is you should never ignore it. You should always listen to it, but it doesn't mean that they're giving you the correct solutions. But if they're complaining, there is some problem somewhere. And it's a question of, is there enough people complaining about it that it's something you should look at now and how to prioritize that list? So if it's a large amount of the community complaining, you obviously want to prioritize that very high. If it's one or two people, prioritize those lower. But generally, you should never ignore player feedback because it's valuable. It can tell you a lot about what's going on with your game. Almost never have I seen the community put forward a solution that I would use <laughs> because they don't have that game design background. They don't understand user experience and UI and everything like that. But they have often pointed me towards things that were problematic and, and that's definitely why you should listen to them. Question number four. Uh, what new innovations, if any, have you seen in the game industry and in using AI machine learning technologies? Uh, I have seen 
machine learning do interesting things for quality assurance, but I haven't necessarily seen it do anything too special for game design itself. That said, there is um, an RPG that is machine learning based uh, AI. All right, here, here it is. Play.aidungeon.io. Uh, we're going to do a quick start. I just want to show it to you real quick. So you pick your setting. We're going to go cyberpunk. I'm going to be a cyborg. Uh, my character's name is Alita. Story is being generated. And you are Alita, a cyborg living in the futuristic city of Zale. You have a bionic arm and a hollow band. You're walking down the dark city streets while neon lights flash brightly above you. As you pass an alley, you see the glint of a sniper rifle. Zed, report in. What do you do? Turn on my thermographic camouflage and duck behind cover. You turn on your thermographic camouflage and duck behind cover. Go, go, go! You instruct your team as they rush into the alley. In the distance, you hear the crackle of gunfire and the whine of a small jet engine. So it's not great. But there is an AI dungeon too now, and uh, I'm, I was looking into it, but it's uh, it's code, and I don't want to deal with that <laughs> at this moment. But um, when this first iteration came out, it was kind of awful, but it's gotten better. And the more you play with it, the more it learns, or at least I think it does. Uh, shoot the jet down. You shoot the jet down. Let's see how it reacts. It's got to think about it. You raise your assault rifle and take aim. The jet appears to be a small one-man aircraft. Its pilot is crouched behind what looks like an ejection seat. See, it responds pretty pretty interestingly. Like, this this would have been impossible even, like, I don't know, 10 years ago? We're, we're headed towards something. I don't know what exactly. We'll see. So, machine learning? Yeah, there's some stuff out there. It's developing. It's going to be interesting. Uh, what do you think about using conversational AI technology in games? For example, giving conversational AI to every NPC. I don't think we're at a point where that's going to be fun. <laughs> like you would have to build a story around it because when you ask the AI certain things, it just goes off the rails. So it has to be like a character who has some form of insanity that they're dealing with, either because they've been through to another dimension or something, because they're going to have all these out of context things and it would be immersion breaking if you didn't support it with the context of the story. So only in that specific case would I use uh, AI conversational uh, NPCs right now. But in the future, I think that they'll get better and you'll be able to limit them to certain things and then it will be much easier to have in context uh, stuff. And it'll be effectively, we'll eventually end up at Westworld. So that'll be fun. Any advice making RTS stories, especially those of a special situation in a pre-existing lore? I would say that if you're going to do something in a pre-existing lore, you have to be careful because it can be easy to get caught in lore clashes where like a fifth part in a novel series happens to mention this town that you thought was isolated and you can have like a battle here and oh actually it's a peaceful city and like you never know that kind of stuff comes up my recommendation is always to make your own lore make your own ip make your own world now i say that as someone who has done that for most of my life so maybe it comes too easily for me and i can't uh sort of appreciate how difficult it might be but um I think it's always better to have your own lore than it is to try and work with someone else's lore that you, Warcraft I'm assuming this is related to, which has, you know, movies and novels and all sorts of games. And I would avoid using Warcraft. Um, use, make your own IP. That's definitely the way to go. What are the best applications for a game designer to develop isometric 2D Suedo 3D games? <clears throat> Some software like Warcraft 3 Map Editor provides tools to create RPG mobile games with multiplayer that allows to minimize coding experience, as I don't have Mike Morheim at home to fix my maps. The best applications for developing isometric 2D Suedo 3D games? It's Unity or Unreal generally for, for anything that's 3D-ish, and you can take your pick which one you like better. Question number eight. Regarding remastering Diablo 2, I believe it was Brevik who said that the remaster should be even more violent, sexy, dark, and over the top than the original. How important do you feel this is with regards to such an iconic game as D2? I don't, I don't think it's that important, but it is important to fans. So fans have certain expectations of what a Diablo game should look like, and if you don't meet those expectations, you get the backlash, and we saw that with Diablo 3. When remastering 
a game with such an iconic aesthetic, should every design be copied over exactly one to one, even if some designs are considered outdated by today's sensibilities? Should they be censored to appease modern sensibilities, or made even more extreme and risque than the original? It's hard to believe that censorship would improve the sales of a game like D2, so just curious what the logic might be when one considers how to approach this when remastering a game. When it comes to this, it's more about the ratings board. Generally speaking, every game wants to be E for everyone. Uh, then there's everyone 10 plus, teen, mature, which a lot of games tend to fall under in, in the violence category. And then you definitely don't want adults only. You, don't just, you just don't want that. Because it won't be put on, I believe it won't be put on certain store shelves. Like you can't be in Walmart with an adults only. When it comes to mature 17 plus, may contain intense violence, blood and gore, sexual content and or strong, strong language. I would say that Diablo 2 sort of like hit the boundary there. 16, Peggy 16, and Mature. Yep. So Diablo 2 skirted a line there between this and this. Prolonged scenes of intense violence, graphic sexual content, and or gambling with real currency. Interesting. The reason that you won't see Diablo as a franchise going more intense on the sexual content and the violence is because they've already hit the sort of cap on where they can be in the, the mature category. The difference between these two is massive in terms of potential sales, or it used to be in the past. Now with everything being digital online only sales, uh, my only question would be, does Steam allow adult only games? And I, I believe they do because they have all the um, hentai. Question number nine, why do scenarios themes tone and lore seem to be so overlooked by game designers these days. When I look back at the old class, classic uh, scenarios, basic as they may be, it always seems to be at least decent and engaging. But the, these days I feel there are more and more big games that have scenarios that make me roll my eyes and I very often hear developers say that a video game only needs a story that goes from level to level. I guess what I'm asking is why there are so many games that cost millions of dollars that could spare some of its budget for at least a decent writer or good narrative developer and choose not to. Well, it's because of games as a service. A, a lot of the basically the games that have become games as a service have decided just to focus totally on the online and the multiplayer. And as a result, the single player suffers. And if you're not investing that much into the single player experience, why would you invest in a good writer or a narrative designer? Maybe 15 to 20 years ago, I would, I would say that every game that came out <clears throat> either was single player focused or had a strong single player. And then in addition to that, might, might also have multiplayer. That was just how we did games back then. And I think we should return to those days. I think that every game should have strong single player, strong multiplayer, and a map editor type thing where the player can develop their own games within your game. I think those are all, I think those are the, that's the triumvirate of a successful uh, game in my opinion. Map editor stuff has been lacking and has fallen to the wayside so much so that an entire industry has been born out of it where you have things like Roblox or Core that are literally just the tools and they only let the the players make everything. It's literally just a cost investment versus return question for most of these uh, companies. That's why they don't do it. Stop buying those games. <laughs> if you want to stop it, stop buying those fucking games and then you'll, they will have to uh, do better. Question number 10. Uh, I usually struggle with finding replayability in games. Uh, let's base ourselves on a top-down shooter, for example. In a very foundational, high-level way, what are the questions you ask to solve this problem? Well, I put replayability in my games. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you mean. Like, let's say you're in a top-down shooter. Um, you know what? The best example of that is Vampire Survivors. So here's Vampire Survivors. Um, the There's a collection aspect here that I don't care about. The main thing is the power-ups, obviously, Greed is the one you want first because the more coins you accumulate quicker than the more you can get coins to buy all the other stuff. And really it's just the, the base thing. So you're going to... I mean, unfortunately, their meta is not terribly well designed in that this is obviously the, the first choice. Whereas unless you want to like see stuff, you might want to do speed or, or, or damage or duration or something. But anyways, I'll just show you the game real quick. 
Um, you can see I've unlocked all the four characters at this point, and we'll go to the well. We'll go to the Matt Inlay Library, and like, it's just W A S D. That's that's all I'm doing. I'm not doing anything special. There's no buttons to press other than that. Um, and the game is quite fun and, and compelling. They did a really good job, and. Um, I look forward to seeing more games like this in the future because they are they're examples of um, and here we go here's a choice and I've got a celebration with all the gems I love it um, we'll go rune tracer because it bounces and we're in the library I'm gonna get yeah that took a bit <clears throat> um, great game great game Uh, play it. Yeah. All right, that totally threw me off track. What was I talking about? Uh, okay. So, if you're having trouble with replayability, think about meta games that can be going on in the background while the in between the sessions of the game, and don't worry too much about like trying to. What, one issue I see is that a lot of uh, early game designers think, oh, I'll just add features within the game and I'll add feature after feature after feature and then it'll be interesting. No, if the core gameplay isn't interesting, then it doesn't matter <laughs> what other features you put in there. So you want to keep it simple, make that core game design really good, really fun to play, and then you add replayability by having sort of meta, either a meta narrative layer or meta uh, objectives that you can do that increase the replayability of the game by allowing you to get farther and things like that and if you build it really well you can do what hades has done which is they have an extremely good narrative layer that has all sorts of reactions to everything you're doing and thus it always feels like you're progressing in some way even when it, it like i'm telling you a lot of it's like kind of smoke and mirrors but it's just that if you get this certain weapon and do the certain thing then there's this certain reaction and I'm sure they have like 10,000 lines of dialogue or something insane like that, but it adds a lot. Uh, question 11. Uh, this person had a group project in game design where one person had to shoulder the burden of getting the game done on time. In the game dev world, does this correlate as a byproduct of poor management? Is there a real world situation in game dev where work is done evenly? No because different things take different amounts of time. Let's say we've got art, we've got programming, we've got design, we've got writing. Typically when it comes to games, the campaign comes last because that's where all the everything comes together. The art, the programming, the narrative design, the writing, like all goes into that. And thus the level design, the campaign design ends up being the last thing. It can be designed ahead of time, but it can't be done ahead of time because you need all those assets in there and all the code for it to, to prepare it. So in game development, there's just incongruency of when things get done. The core writing will be done first, but it will get edited throughout. So it's typically code that has to finish first, but then there's bug fixing towards the end. And then art actually ends up always being the ones who are done first because you can say the art is done it looks good as good as it's going to look and then unless there's like some weird bug or missing art that's the only time that the artists have to come back in so if you want to be the first one done in, in game development be the artist it's not a byproduct of poor management um, it's just that some people have areas of knowledge that are specific and only they can do certain things so when it comes to if someone programmed the engine for the game for example if that person you know gets hit by a truck we have to hope that they've trained enough people <laughs> in what their engine does and they've written their code in such a way that it's you know got comments and everything such that someone could take over there have been games that got shut down because a person left the studio and no one could do <laughs> no one could take over for them and it was basically sort of like a, a, at this point we would have to start over from scratch in order to continue if i'm the game designer and i'm writing all these systems i need to have at least two other people 
who can look through my sheets and understand all of my game design. And that's one of the reasons that I have the KISS methodology of design, keep it simple, stupid, because I want anyone to be able to go in, read my document, look at the spreadsheet and figure out what, what I intended there for the game. And that way, if I do get hit by a truck, then the game continues without me and my legacy is secured. Question 12. What game engine would you recommend to a completely new indie developer? Even if you're a completely new developer, I still recommend like learning Unity and Unreal. You can also learn Godot, that, that one's good too. But in terms of commercial use, so like if your intent is to become a game developer within the industry, Unreal or Unity are the two big ones that everyone uses. So therefore, the more time you spend in them learning them, then the, the more viable you will be for a career path in the game industry. So uh, Unity or Unreal. Question 13. Do you recommend starting game dev by yourself or with others? How do you find the right people to work with? I recommend starting by yourself. Uh, you have to figure out what your areas are of expertise and broaden your knowledge enough that you can sort of have an understanding of everything that goes into a game. Finding the right people to work with, at my stage in, in my career, it's more a matter of do I like these people, would I get along with them, and is the project they're working on uh, something that I would be interested in, thus have fun while I'm developing it. Those are my main considerations. For new developers, it's personality match. That's really all there is to it. Because if you're all in the same boat or you're all relatively new, then you're all sort of in the learning stage and then you just want people who are going to be conducive to learning and not negative and toxic and tearing you down. And you want, and you similarly have to be that kind of person. Because if you're not like, yes and we can do this, the yes and style of, of of brainstorming, then you're going to be spending most of your time fighting about stupid stuff that's not going to matter and you're not going to be able to make the game. Try it out with whoever you think you would get along with and then if it doesn't work out just go back and work by yourself. You just sort of have to know yourself enough to know how you, you will get along with other personalities and that is just a factor of experience and time and working with different people. Are you happy about your job, the results of it, etc? For example, if I were reborn, would I choose my job again or would I choose another job? And what job would it be? No, I'm pretty happy with my career. Uh, I've worked on a lot of amazing games. I've had a few missteps, obviously, but um, I don't think I would do anything differently or at least if I were to do something differently, like I'd want it to be like totally different. Like I'd like to be born on Mars and like become like a terraformer and engineer or something and explore alien worlds. My imagination's kind of out there in terms of like what would be interesting to me if I were to be reborn. You know, like maybe it'd be fun to be a, a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, but probably not. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're living in an age now where we're so close to simulating everything such that I could experience any lifetime that I would want. I mean, we're literally about 10 to 20 years away from everyone having brain implants. So I, I don't see any reason to change timelines or be reborn and do something else because I'm effectively on the frontier of where those simulated worlds will come from. And I may have a large hand in creating storylines and, and, and legacy that will last for eternity, maybe. <laughs> Question 15. I wanted to ask how much time you guys had to develop the Warcraft 3 maps with the... Oh, no, it's a Warcraft 3 question. How'd you get in here? Damn it. Uh, fine. Even the most complicated map was like two months at most, two to three months. And we had plenty of time for cleanup passes. Literally, it went through the QA process. And then whenever a bug would come up, we'd go back into our map and we'd clean up whatever the bug was or fix it. And while we were in there, we would obviously fix other things here and there that we personally uh, weren't happy with. And that process continued up until Goldmaster. And at the point of Goldmaster, it was literally only a show-stopping bug could be changed. In, and that's how it went. Yeah, about two months. Two to three months. Question 16. List some of your favorite game mechanics. Things that make you go, man, I wish I had that idea. Or this single mechanic makes the game so much better and so on. In Gears of War, when you reload your weapon, there's like a sweet spot. And if you reload at that exact, if you hit the button again at that exact time, the reload's much faster and quicker and it feels good. I think Gears of War without that would have been... <laughs> Quite a, quite a lot less interesting because the the actual shooter aspects of it are so stagnant. Like it's literally run to a cover spot and shoot at stuff and then run to another cover spot and shoot at stuff. I, I can't think of anything really in terms of game mechanics that I wish I had thought of. I've just, there's 
mechanics that I appreciate and I the important thing is to recognize why they were put in and, and how they improve the game and, and why they feel good in those situations. Context matters a lot. Like reversals and fighters I thought was an interesting addition to the genre because prior to that there was like nothing. Like Street Fighter 2 doesn't have reversals. So I, I like that sort of aspect where you can react and you can get these back and forths like that. Uh, all of it comes down to really small things. So for example, in for the health system of Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, there's a mechanic where you shake off damage and it's literally just like when you're not being shot or anything, you just hit the button and he'll shake and like the bullets will fly off and you'll regain health. Brilliant. Brilliant mechanic. And uh, it it's it's the context that matters the most. And with the right context, you can do really cool mechanics um, that make sense. And as long as they make sense and feel good, boom, got a great mechanic. Question 17. I don't really know how to ask this nicely. Okay. But from your perspective, how competent slash incompetent is your average project manager lead in video game development? <laughs> Because a lot of postmortems I've read where the scope balloons out of manageability, a scope wasn't even present, uh, or a scope wasn't even present, seems to me like there isn't a video game equivalent of a design document that lays out the features, aspects, etc. of a game. Okay, well, that's a little unfair. Um, no, there are design documents that lay out the features of the game. The problem is, once you start making the game, you're going through the prototyping phase. Um, if you haven't done your due diligence and found the core and made sure it's fun, then you get into these situations where you're like, oh, if we just add this one feature, oh, if we just add this one more feature. And then it's basically putting lipstick on a pig. And then uh, inevitably in all those postmortems, you'll also find that they had their eureka moment where they're like, oh, this is what we should have been doing all along. And it's like, if you had just stayed in the pre-production phase and done more prototyping, you would have found it sooner. None of us is as dumb as all of us, wherein you've got all these people here, you've got to build something, you've got a certain amount of time for a pre-production phase, but all these other people who have jobs here need to justify their existence somehow. That's where you get into trouble and that's where you start going big time down a wrong path. And it's just a byproduct of corporate game design environments where these people need to be doing something or they need to be laid off. You don't want to lose your entire team every time you finish a game, but that is the threat that hangs over every studio, is that if they these people aren't doing anything, then why are we paying them money? And that's the problem with capitalism. Question 18. Hey Dave, would love to hear how you tested games in a bit more detail and on what level of testing you did. Did you just run acceptance tests or did you run other test results as well as integration tests and how did you do those if you did? Big thanks from a two plus year experience QA tester. Also, how was it being a tester at that time? So back in my day, uh, this is like 1999. Yeah, it, being a tester was a little bit different. Like um, we didn't have like, any of these things. It was really just sit down, play the game, and see what you can find. Um, at least it was in Blizzard QA. And later on we would start to develop, develop checklists and things like that. Does it do this? Does it do that? Uh, does this work? Does that work? Um, and so it it was just that, you know, back in those days, QA testing for games was sort of in an early stage of development. My sort of claim to fame in the QA department was simply that um, I found the weird bugs that uh, that other people might miss. Uh, maybe that's just a, how I pay attention to detail and then, you know, things that happen briefly over here that other people might just not notice or they just sort of ignore and move on. I would go, wait, something's wrong. And I would go investigate and see what, see what that is. Um, like one thing was like, there was a bug where you could turn Zerglings into lurkers lurkers into mutilus i don't remember exactly what it was but there was some weird bug in starcraft uh that w where you could do that and i was the only one who could do it consistently so when uh when the programmers said they had fixed it i was the one to test whether or not that was actually fixed because i was the only one who could do it consistently so it's sort of that that sort of thing other than like diablo 2 we had lots of lists because we had to look for and make sure that every prefix weapon suffix prefix armor suffix would work in the game and so 
you know, that had a lot of lists. Tons of lists. I mean, that was the, the main testing I did was like literally just play the game just because I was pretty good at finding stuff. Question number 19. What is the best way to manage organized workflow in the company of a game project, especially something of a large scale such as an MMO? Which company that you worked for did it best and how? The best way to manage and organize workflow that I've personally experienced um, is Agile Scrum. Um, but the problem is that different studios have different ways of interpreting it. The way to do Agile Scrum correctly is to make everyone personally responsible for what they say they are going to do. It's basically the producer acts as a timekeeper and um, planner by going to each person and going, here are the tasks that you've agreed to do. How long do you think it will take to do it? And then you give your estimate and then they hold you to it and then it's in the calendar and, and you have the burn down charts and everything kind of works from that process. And that's what I've seen good producers do is they, they work within the Scrum Agile process by making sure that everyone's responsible for what they're going to do. Everyone gives an estimate of time for how long it's going to take and, and from that you develop the whole, the whole thing. It, it really is about personal responsibility and making sure that everyone is held accountable to what they say they are going to do. And once you have that, once everyone is personally accountable, they're effectively autonomous and you don't have to worry about something until there's a problem. And the problem will become apparent very, very quickly because everyone's responsible for that time and someone's keeping, the producer is keeping that time and, and they'll know when you're going over, eh, we're redlining, what's going on? And they'll come talk to you and then you figure out what's going on and if you need help and so on. And that is the best workflow that I've seen. Okay, question 20. How do you plan out the actions to take for level design? You mean when I'm designing a level, how do I decide what to do? Basically, it's everyone works differently, but for me, it's more like um, I need a story element. I need the context for everything that's supposed to happen in the level. And then from that, I sort of develop the area. So I know where it is. So in this area, what things would exist and what would be going on? And is there a town? Is there townsfolk? Is there monsters? What are those monsters doing? What's their relationship with everything? And it just sort of flows from that. And then from there, I do the layout first. And then I place the monsters in the various areas that I was thinking of that they would be and then I have the core gameplay that that whatever you're doing on this map um, obviously those would be first because you sort of need to know like oh if there's an enemy base over here that affects everything on the map and well, what the context would be how, how do I make a level is basically I guess what the real question is and it's like it starts from story context and then like the core aspects of the gameplay what am, what am I doing and why and from that, everything everything flows. Question 21. How do you fight against demotivation? I'm not very good at fighting against demotivation. <laughs> um, I think generally what I do is when I'm exhausted on a task or exhausted on something that I'm working on, like I feel like I'm not progressing or I'm just sitting there and staring at it and going, I don't know what to do. I go do something else. And that something else could be maybe I work on a different level. It could be maybe I write out a script for something. Maybe I go and put on my Oculus and like go chat with people in, you know, <laughs> the chat world. Um, it's just when you feel that brain exhaustion, that's a sign that you need to stop and go do something else to recharge. And that recharging, it could be anything for you. I don't know. For me, it's like... I want to just watch a movie or ride my bike or go have a drink and, <laughs> and not that I'm recommending that. Um, you just have to figure out what your thing is because if you're an extrovert, maybe you need to go outside and talk to people or maybe you need to go hang out with your friends or something like that. It's really up to the individual, but it, it when you're feeling demotivated, that's a sure sign that you need to stop and go do something else and come back to it when you've had a better idea. Sometimes it's just a good night's sleep. And that's why I 100% agree with not doing crunch because if you're demotivated and crunching, it's so much worse <laughs> because there's nothing you can do. You just have to sit there at your desk not knowing what to do when really what you needed was like a good night's sleep or to play with your kid or to go on a ride or on your bike or whatever. Question 22. How do you prevent going too far with a level or design? 
See, that's a good one. That's also a tough one. But basically, this is why I have the KISS methodology of design. Keep it simple, stupid. I've found that as soon as you're putting too much stuff on something, it's it, because it doesn't feel right. That's when you're going too far because you need to fix whatever the core problem is first. <laughs> Um, once the core problem is fixed, then you can add on top of it. But make sure that anything you add onto it makes sense from context, like it works with the story and the context of what you're doing. Make sure that it works from an aspect of improvement. Is it making something better? Because if it's detracting from it or making it too complicated and the player doesn't get it, then you're making it worse. So it's really about minimum complete product <laughs> because once that's complete and it's fun and it's enjoyable you should really be working on something else that isn't rather than continuing to add on to that and that goes for everything from game systems to game mechanics to level design everything get it as good as it can be and complete and then move on to something else because you can always come back later and add features but until the whole thing is done there's no point uh, in, in continuing to work on something that's already effectively done. Question 23. Do you have any thoughts on why these very successful game developers seem to fade away more than make it big outside Blizzard? It seems like there's not much public activity going on. For example, with Bonfire Studios, it's a six-year-old game company and has yet to announce a game. I'm very hopeful about Mike Morheim's new company, but I might be naive. Is it possible to make a new Blizzard today or has the changes in the market made that highly unlikely? Um, okay. <laughs> Why do game developers seem to fade away? Because they were never really in the limelight, generally speaking. Um, and then they did something that everyone loved, and then they maybe got caught up in their own hubris and moved on to stuff that no one cared about. Like, I mean, take me for example. My claim to fame is basically Warcraft 3, but I've worked on really cool other stuff that just not that well known or people didn't really care about like wasteland 3 is an amazing game odd world strangers wrath is a mind-blowing game from for its time period but you know i'm just not known for that i'm known for warcraft 3 for whatever reason it's not so much that the developers fade away it's just that they're doing other stuff that you might not care about as much and so they sort of fell off your radar um, concerning bonfire i have no idea what's going on there so i'm gonna skip it because i don't want to talk crap and I am also very hopeful about uh, Dreamhaven and what Mike Morheim is doing, creating. So if you don't know what Dreamhaven is, it's basically an umbrella company that handles like all of the business aspects of creating a game development studio so that the game development studios that are under the umbrella of Dreamhaven don't have to worry about that. And I think that's a really smart and, and good business plan. There's the upfront cost that they're dealing with, but they are effectively creating a path for known successful developers to do something good and letting them do it. From my perspective, that's obviously a genius move because um, really it is the biz dev stuff that gets in the way. Like, I don't want to run my own company because I don't want to deal with biz dev stuff. I don't want to be have to making deals and talking to VC people. I just don't want to do that stuff. I want to create stuff. Dreamhaven to me is a very smart and very positive for the game industry move. It is possible to make a new Blizzard today. In fact, there are probably three or four new Blizzards that are right now developing their first game. I would consider Supergiant Games to be uh, a, a new Blizzard effectively because everything they do is great. I've loved every game they've made. They're all in the same vein, but they are definitely They've got a vision and they execute on it and it's really good. Hades being, you know, one of the best. In terms of the marketplace, I would only say that it favors monetization more than it favors good games. The only way to stop that is to stop giving money. But the problem is that you're now competing with whales for the attention of studios like Blizzard. But I think under the Microsoft umbrella, Blizzard will do better. Question 24. Why did you eventually leave QA? Asking for someone who has been in QA in quite a few industries for about 22 years. Um, I left QA because QA was not my calling. QA was something, was my foot in the door to get to a creative process because I'm, I was very much 
planning to be a writer in the game industry. Level design was the closest thing to being a writer at Blizzard that was possible. So when I left QA, it was because I had promise in that in the area of level design. And it came from my storytelling background. I don't have anything against QA. I had a really good time in QA at, at Blizzard. My end goal was to be a writer in the game industry. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess I've succeeded since I've done a lot of writing for games. Um, though I've done a lot more narrative design, which I think is actually more interesting. So I'm glad that I went into games and eventually became... Really, I'm a jack of all trades at this point when it comes to design. Um, and I would say I have a few masteries and not none. <laughs> okay, that's it. The next one that I'll probably get into will be game industry questions. I hope you enjoyed this first foray into the Ask Dave Anything uh, <laughs> series. We'll see how many there are. Um, some of them might be end up as shorts as opposed to long form ones like this one ended up. If you have any more questions, feel free to add them on to either the comments there or join me on my Discord and ask me there. Then I will add them to this list and I will try to answer them. Peace. Thank you.